Hi! So today I wanted to talk about the neuroscience book The Forgetting Machine by Rodrigo Kien Corrige. And I think this book was really good. It dives into the topic of memory and how we are our memory. And then for example, when we change someone's memory that they really change the person they are. And so I think this is a super popular topic right now in media. So for example, you see this in one of my favorite movies, Blade Runner. And in Blade Runner, they are in this memory facility where they try to create these artificial memories. What makes your memory so authentic? Well, there's a bit of every artist in their work. But I was locked in a sterile chamber at eight, so... If I wanted to see the world, I had to imagine it. So memory really makes us who we are and that's why you get these super sad stories of how people with Alzheimer's for example are not recognized anymore by their family because their memory loss really makes them lose a part of their selves. So the science of memory is really this transcendence between mind and matter and Rodrigo tries to describe in his book all the different facets of memory and how they make us who we are. So I want to dive into three topics that he discusses in his book from how memories are made from our vision to memory fallacies and in the end a little bit about the Jennifer Aniston neuron which is Rodrigo's own work and I hope you will learn a little bit more about memory along the way and I also highly recommend of course to read the book if you're interested in any of this work. So he starts his first chapter with information theory and vision and that's because what we actually remember is of course what we record right but the interesting thing is that we don't really record like a camera so we don't have the full picture in sharp focus at all times but we actually only see with a tiny part of our eye or a tiny part of our visual field is in high spatial resolution and this is the visual fovea and the fovea is this small depression within a neurosensory retina where the visual acuity is the highest. So the interesting thing is that even though we have the feeling that we see our full visual field in focus, we actually only see the center in focus or the point where we focus on. And we get the full visual field because our eyes are making these tiny saccades through the visual space and that then records the entire visual field. So our brain is actually constructing this entire image of a full in focus visual field and this is also the reason that magicians for example can do their tricks quite easily because we actually don't see as much as we think we see so, so if they then diverge our attention to a certain part in the visual field they can easily do their trick in another part because we're actually not recording that part even though our brain is constructing this image that we see the entire visual field so it's for example then quite interesting that when we look at faces we have the idea that we see the entire face as a whole we actually record parts of the face in sequence so we first look at the eyes for example then the nose and then the mouth and then the brain makes an entire face of it and something that i find quite interesting is that some artists have picked up on this. May it be because they have some knowledge of neuroscience or because they just thought about this. But for example, Picasso does this a lot in his pictures where he focuses on each part of the face in detail and then makes a kind of abstract face from it. Although it is probably a little bit closer to how we actually see in real life. So Rodrigo then says that the eye does not see but the brain does. And then our memories, because our memories are created from what the eye is seeing or what our senses are feeling. Our memories are then not like a camera, but a little bit more like a book that was written by the brain. And he actually gives this super nice quote from Aristotle that I want to read for you guys a little bit. Thinking is different from perceiving and is held to be in part imagination, in part judgment. But what we imagine is sometimes false, though our contemporaneous judgment about it is true. So Rodrigo then says that based on past experiences, our brain constructs our current reality and this is again a little bit this idea of the Bayesian brain where we update our priors by new information we get such that our estimations of the current reality are as accurate as possible. So we can already see from this chapter that our memory is a little bit faulty. So he then delves into the fact that the confidence we have in our memories is actually not really possible. Lenny. You can't trust a man's life to your little notes and pictures. Why not? Because your notes could be unreliable. Memory's unreliable. Ah, oh, please. No, 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 really. No, Memory's not perfect. It's not even that good. Ask the police. Eyewitness testimony is unreliable. The cops don't catch a killer by sitting around remembering stuff. Right. I they collect know. facts. That's not what I'm saying. They make notes and they draw conclusions. Facts, not memories. 
So he goes into this case of Robert Cotton, which I want to uh, show you guys a little bit because I think it's a super good example of how our faulty memories can really destroy another person's life and why you should never be 100% confident in memories you have because our memory system is so tricky. So the case goes like this. In 1984, Jennifer Thompson, a college student in North Carolina, was raped by a person who broke into her home. With a knife to her throat, unable to escape, Thompson decided decided to focus on her rapist face and remember every one of his traits and features so that someday if she survived the attack she would be able to identify him and secure his conviction. Thompson examined the photographs in the police office for about five minutes before she identified Ronald Cotton. She was convinced that she identified her rapist but she was wrong. At the age of 22 Ronald Cotton was sentenced to life in prison but sometime later by chance the prison admitted a serial rapist who resembles Ronald Cotton. Bobby Poole. Cotton heard that Poole was the man who actually raped Jennifer Thompson and this was later confirmed by DNA analysis. However, when Jennifer Thompson was confronted by the fact that it couldn't have been Robert Cotton that committed the crime, but that it was actually Bobby Poole as confirmed by DNA analysis, she confirmed that she still saw Robert Cotton's face when she looked back on this memory. So what Rodrigo actually think happened is that Jennifer Thompson replaced her memory of Poole by Cotton because she saw the picture of Cotton straight after her case happened. And this is something that our brain does a lot. We replace pictures or we replace stories into our own narrative. So our memory is literally just written by our brain and it could be anything. So and then his the final part of his book goes a little bit more into research that he did himself. And I think this research is amazing. So I would also highly recommend to read the following two papers of his if you like this kind of research. And that is concept cells, the building blocks of declarative memory functions and plugging into human memory. So I will put both of them down below in the resources if you want to read them. So his research is about this Jennifer Aniston neuron and it made a huge wave in the neuroscience community when it was found out that these kind of neurons exist. The Jennifer Aniston neuron reacts to a name and pictures of a person showing that these neurons react to super specific concepts. So these neurons are made by these intracranial recordings of people with epilepsy. And intracranial means that a part of the skull is removed and we literally make the recordings directly from the brain. And this is so much more valuable, for example, than EEG or fMRI data, because usually with this type of data, there's a lot more noise, whereas these intracranial recordings have a lot less noise. So in this case, they did the intracranial recordings from the medial temporal lobe and the medial temporal lobe includes the hippocampus, amygdala, parahippocampal regions and is crucial for episodic and spatial memory. So they then recorded the neurons of awake participants in this region and then one of the first such neurons found, so the Jennifer Aniston neuron was in the hippocampus and it fired to seven different pictures of the actors Jennifer Aniston and not to 80 other pictures of known and unknown people, animals and or places. So it actually reacted to these super specific pictures of Jennifer Aniston and they later also saw that it reacted to pictures of, for example, co-workers of Jennifer Aniston and her name and everything related to the concept Jennifer Aniston. And that is why these neurons are now called Jennifer Aniston neurons in the popular media, but they're also called concept neurons more formally. And these neurons then record actually certain concepts. So in his paper, he gives this super good example, I think, of Luke Skywalker. And then these neurons react to the concept of Luke Skywalker or the concept of Star Wars. And then, for example, these neurons would also react if we show the participants a picture of Yoda or a picture of Darth Vader, if they have the concept of Star Wars. So Rodrigo then thinks that such partially overlapping representation could be the basis of the encoding and learning of associations of episodic memory. Episodic memory is defined as the ability to recall and mentally re-experience specific episodes from one's personal past. So yeah, I think these single cell recordings really taught us a lot about how we actually learn. So we already know from experience that a lot of people learn in concepts. So we relate new information to old information we have in this kind of concept frame. But by these single cell recordings, we also actually saw this pattern emerge in neurons. Whereas before we couldn't really see this because, for example, the neurons in our visual fields just react to basic visual features. But we see then that the neurons in the 
temporal medial lobe actually react to these higher cognition features. So, so yeah, that was the book I wanted to talk about today. And if you have any recommendations for me what to read next, I would love to hear them. So put them down below. And otherwise, see you next week. Bye. <laughs>